Okay, uh, welcome everybody to our, our mission council membership meeting. This is on February 7th, 2024. And we usually start our membership meetings out with a uh, guest speaker at the beginning. And uh, because our chapter is working on the move the money uh, resolution for Detroit, the importance of cutting military funding for social needs, we were very, very lucky and fortunate to have with us a special guest tonight, David Swanson. And let me just give you a short uh, bio of him before he comes on. He's an, most of you know him already, but he's an author, activist, journalist, and radio. He's the executive director of World Beyond War, and he's campaign coordinator for Roots Action. Uh, his books include War is a Lie. He blogs at, at uh, davidswanson.org and, and warisacrime.org. He also hosts Talk World Radio. He's the Nobel Peace Prize nominee and a U.S. Peace Prize recipient. Uh, and so with those credentials, I guess he qualifies to be on our meeting. So uh, very much uh, thank you so much for being with us, David. Uh, how are you doing? Where do you, where do you live right now? Uh, same place I've lived for a long, long time, Charlottesville, Virginia. Charlottesville, Virginia, cool. And is that near uh, Washington, D.C.? Well, I'm very happy that it's over 100 miles from Washington, D.C., but to people in other parts of the world, it seems to just count as being in Washington, D.C., <laughs> you know. Hundred miles. All right, so I wonder if you wouldn't mind starting out explaining, we, we know what you've been involved in, of course, but World uh, Beyond War is a very important organization that the executive director. Can you give us an idea of what your work is and how long it's existed? Tell us a little bit about that group. Oh, yeah. World Beyond War is a nonprofit organization uh, with staff and board members and advisory board members and volunteers and organizers and supporters uh, all over the world. Uh, people have signed our Declaration of Peace in 196 countries. We've got dozens of chapters now. We've just hired organizers in Africa and Latin America as well as North America. Um, we're, we're growing at a, and the rate we're growing is increasing. Um, and we've been around for about exactly 10 years. We just made a, a video and a podcast celebrating that we're 10 years old. Um, we've not abolished war in the 10 years, uh, but we have, you know, prevented some wars, been part of preventing some wars. We've prevented some bases being opened. We've uh, prevented some weapons being shipped. We've educated many, many people. We've uh, passed countless resolutions and gotten lots of institutions and localities to divest from weaponry. Um, and we, we do our best to educate and to mobilize nonviolent activism uh, toward ending particular wars with an understanding that we're trying to end all wars and all preparations for wars uh, and sort of pushing back against the idea that even though every war anybody ever encounters is not quite right, it's one of the bad wars, there might be a good war next Thursday if the stars align. Uh, with the with the argument that there's no such thing, it's an incoherent idea, it couldn't possibly be, but if it were, if it existed, the goodness of that good war couldn't outweigh all the damage done by all the bad wars that everyone agrees are bad wars that are generated by investing most of our money in preparations for war and uh, the damage done by that investment of money, which kills more people than all the wars in the world put together. Um, you know, more people die and are injured and are traumatized and are made homeless by the redirection of those funds into weaponry and militarism rather than useful things, then die from all the wars. Uh, and of course, the risk of nuclear apocalypse and the risk of all the non-optional crises like environmental disaster that we need the resources for, we can't be continuing this madness uh, of investing 
everything in war. So we we are very much in favor of moving the money, <laughs> moving and we and we educate and we write books and we do webinars and we put up billboards with, you know, three percent of just the U.S. military budget could end starvation on Earth and all the other trade offs. You know, how many teachers and houses and and solar panels could you have in Detroit instead of just the taxes that people in Detroit pay into the Pentagon? It's it's staggering. Uh, and move the money maybe also in another way. We, you know, it's only it's only about one and a half percent of just U.S. military spending that went into the most expensive election in history uh, three and a half years ago. But maybe sit one out and put all that money that's wasted on choosing between one servant of oligarchy and another into activism into principled education and activism to change the world just a, just a thought yes uh thank you david for those comments uh i'm curious um we just really started our mission peace council chapter of the u.s peace council a year or so ago and starting to rebuild and uh, you've been very successful with all your campaigns what do you think is the best method the best way to, for organizations like ours to grow to get people involved in these issues. Well, you want to have achievable goals uh, because people are weak and fragile and they need to see a success coming soon in order to keep working for a, for a more distant success. Um, I wish that weren't the case. For some people it isn't, but for a lot of people it is. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of localities in the United States used to do divestment, and we encouraged everybody get your city to divest money from weaponry and maybe fossil fuels and some other evil things at the same time. That's been a lot harder since the Russian invasion of Ukraine because we used to be able to tell people to to, to show them data that you know you could actually make as much or more money investing in things other than weapons isn't true anymore and so if if you have a if you have a city council or a university board or something that isn't legally obligated to maximize profit is allowed to not maximize profit if there's a good reason then you're still okay but if it's if they're legally bound to maximize profit you can't you can't tell them uh that there's a way to do it without weaponry, because weaponry is the way to maximize profit nowadays. Hopefully that will change. Uh, and if we move things in a peaceful direction, it will change. Um, but that doesn't mean you can't uh, pursue other uh, strategic campaigns that have early successes. Uh, all kinds of cities. I mean, Chicago just did it, are, are passing resolutions demanding a ceasefire in Gaza. Uh, if this hasn't been done where you live, it should be done. And it should be done in a way that maximizes public education in the process. That is, you should have the best possible public fora and media outreach and op-eds and letters and speakers at public hearings uh debates if possible very, very vastly underestimated uh type of event is a is a friendly debate with people who disagree with you um there's a, a large large and growing percentage of people in the united states who don't believe such a thing is possible so it's, it's also a demonstration to them um and and do it in such a way that you maximize membership and buy-in for for future activities uh get everybody's name and every variety of contact information and give them jobs and responsibilities um and build uh build an organization in the process so that the second thing you do you're bigger than the first thing you did um but there's you know there's all kinds of things you can do locally um in, in terms of of nonviolent demonstrations and educational forums and protests and shutting down weapons dealers and protesting Congress members and blocking weapons shipments and trains and trucks uh, and things you can be part of globally. Um, you know, there are global days of action, global movements to, to create treaties, global movements to get 
international courts to do the right thing. We're having some success at the moment with the International Court of Justice, but there are next steps to be pushed for. Um, in other words, don't put absolutely everything into the worst possible place where everything good in the world goes to die, namely the U.S. Congress. Uh, think of some some other avenues of uh, of education and activism, at least in addition to that. Um, I, there are, you know, there are some some better than your average Congress members, and Ms. Rashida Tlaib may be near the top of that list, if not at it, but uh, working within, you know, <laughs> an utterly uh, corrupted system. Yeah, well, I, um, I happen to live in a city called Hamtramck, which is inside Detroit. It's a little small, two square mile city. And I think we were, if not the first, one of the first cities in the country to uh, have a ceasefire resolution passed. And Rashida Tlaib is from our district here. So we we're very fortunate to have her here. Um, so we're trying to get this move the money resolution now passed into Detroit, which is the most important city in Michigan. And um, we're also going to try to pass an Amtramic. So Amtramic may become, so far, I know, I don't think there's any city in the country that's passed the move the money resolution yet. New York is very close. But Hamtramck might again be the first in the country to pass a, a, a resolution. And we're, we're writing our resolution so that it can be writ written for every city in Michigan. So I, I'm hoping that this gets spread around as much as possible and all the people that work with us can make it to their city and pass the resolution. Uh, so what do you think about the Move the Money Project? Does that fit in with the scheme of things? Like I've one, been, one, uh, one thing I've been People say that uh, you, you get more jobs and you may, it's more effective if you use money in social programs than in military spending. Can you sort of explain how that reality exists? Yeah. Um, we have a, we've had for years a draft resolution and links to numerous resolutions that have been passed in various parts of the country on asking Congress to move the money uh, at worldbeyondwar.org slash resolution. Uh, and one and it's it's been done for years and years and and should continue to be done for years and years um, and uh, or until we succeed in moving all the money. And one thing that's been helpful, uh, you know, obviously is to get one city to pass one and then make a lot of noise, get a lot of media, celebrate it, promote it, everybody else do the same, catch up with this city. Um, a, a, another is, uh, is to get mayors on board and take it to the U.S. Conference of Mayors, uh, which typically most years, if not every year for many years, has passed such a resolution. Um, and if if your city has a good mayor who supports the resolution and is on board with it and goes to the US Conference of Mayors meeting, then you can work on taking the lead in making that happen. And then that makes bigger news when the mayors of the country uh, collectively demand that Congress move the money. Um, another thing that you can do that some cities have done, uh, New Haven, Connecticut was the first that I recall doing this in recent years, uh, was uh, as a second step after you pass such a resolution, get the city to do a study and hold hearings on what would be the economic impact locally of moving the money uh, and how could it be done locally to transition, to convert from some of the local war industries to peaceful industries, um, and and what would be what would be the impacts? Uh, not not morally, God forbid, anyone give a shit about mass murdering people, but economically, uh, what would be the impact? Um, and of course, you're right. If the if the studies that the University of Massachusetts Amherst economists have done for years, that everybody has referred to for years are right, then if you invest the same dollars at the national level in education or in green energy or in any of five or six other fields rather than in militarism, you get more jobs and in some cases much better paying jobs. And, and this is the real clincher that people seem to struggle to, to fully comprehend. 
even if you never taxed that money from working people in the first place and never spent it on anything out of the federal government, you would get more jobs. So in other words, taxing working people uh, and spending it on militarism reduces jobs in the United States. Military spending is not a job creator. It's not a poor job creator. It's not a weak job creator. It's a job eliminator. And the reason that this is difficult for people to get through their skulls is that all their neighbors work for military contractors and they see military jobs everywhere. And how can there, how could there be a negative number of military jobs? No, those are real people with real jobs, sad to say. But had you spent that money any other way or not taxed it from ordinary people who, by the way, were never taxed before your favorite war and the worst thing humanity's ever done to itself, World War II, you would have more jobs, better paying jobs. Uh, and, and the difference is so huge, right? And this is not news. This has been known for a hundred years. The difference is so huge that the savings is so great that if the federal government spent money on education and green energy, it would have enough money left over to do training and transitioning and make sure everybody that lost a job got personally into a better job. That is not a single person has to suffer in such a transition. Um, and, you know, there have been bills introduced in Congress since long before I was alive uh, to do this. Um, they've just never passed, but it's been done. It's, you know, been done on a large scale after World War II, been done in certain places like California, been done, been planned for in places like Connecticut, where they knew exactly what they would have to do until they figured out that it was <laughs> that it was a right wing lie that the military budget was going to shrink. It, it never shrank uh, and has been done on a small scale here and there without anybody noticing, uh, such as during uh, COVID, there were military uh, companies that were told to cooperate with several other weapons companies and move some money and create the equipment that's needed to deal with this pandemic. And despite all their lies about not being able to work with each other and not being able to transition and not being able to train people for different machines, it went smooth as could be, you know, on a small scale. This needs to be done on a larger scale. Wow, thank you so much for your inspirational, uh, important comments. And uh, I know everyone here has some questions and comments to make, so we're, we'll open it up now. And uh, we got another 40 minutes, maybe, at the most, for people's comments. And uh, the way we'll do this is uh, there's a reaction button at the bottom that you get on the screen, you know, and you raise your hand like this, and it goes up in the screen. So if you want to talk, raise your hand, and you'll come up in, in the order that you raise your hand. They'll come up with your hand. So um, <clears throat> let's start out with uh, uh, anybody have their hand up now? Okay, you have to unmute yourself. Uh, what, raise your hand and I'll unmute you. And if, uh, okay, so we'll have Jim Ryan uh, speak first. Uh, Jim, Jim was a uh, the author, uh, the writer of our Move the Money resolution, who crafted into the words we're using. And he's, he's uh, welcome, Jim. Feel free to talk. Uh, Dave, thank, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I'm a little confused. You, you said it, uh, earlier that uh, uh, the money is in the weapons, but then later on, uh, uh, you said that, uh, and you know, you can get a lot more jobs with non weapons uh, 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 jobs. So what is it? I mean, because that's the uh, the argument. I know Heidi uh, Peltier, uh, the Cost of War Project, has a couple of uh, papers on that where she gives the uh, graphs of uh, how many college student, college teachers you can get uh, for such and such money. But maybe you could explain that a little bit more. Maybe I didn't understand. I don't, I, I apologize for being unclear. And I also apologize for not understanding exactly what you're asking me. Um, 
it, it, it sounds like you're asking me why would they be putting so much money into militarism when it produces fewer jobs? I mean, the, the short answer is because they don't give a shit about people. Um, and a lot of what they do is not rational and doesn't make sense and isn't what smart, intelligent, caring people would do. Um, but I, I suspect I'm not answering the question. Can you? Well, I, I think you said that uh, people were looking around and saying, well, the money is in uh, weapons manufacturing. So why, you know, why shouldn't we continue that? But then, you know, later on, you said uh, we can get a lot more bang for our buck. Uh, this is, of course, looking at the numbers, uh, the real numbers. Uh, so is so, but what what do we need to do to show people uh, that we can get a lot more money, a lot a lot more positive things out of not spending on uh, uh, weapons manufacturing? Well, I've never. And I think I would have because everybody disputes everything and shows you anytime they think you're wrong, even if even if you're really not. I think I would have heard if there were any argument against the studies that have been done at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst um, that are linked to from the, the Web page worldbeyondwar.org slash resolution. Um, and these studies show that if you moved the money. If instead of spending money on militarism, you spent money on education, you would get more jobs and they would be better paying jobs and the ripple effect in the economy would be better, not to mention things we might add, like those people might sleep better at night and so forth. Um, I, I Once again, I'm not sure I'm grasping the question. I, I mean, the reason we want to move the money out of militarism is because it's in militarism <laughs> and, and we want to move it out of militarism into useful things, non mass murderous things. Uh, well, I want to do that because I'm against mass murder, but the economic argument is that you would get more jobs and better paying jobs. I mean, it's it's so disgustingly sociopathic to be arguing that we need all this weaponry and all these bases and all these wars because it's a jobs program. The point is, it isn't even true on its own sociopathic terms. It's false. Um, we ought not to have to bother saying that, right? I, I, I mean, I remember uh, many years ago now, um, uh, a panel discussion on a stage with uh, the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, and the uh, U.S., uh, the last U.S. ambassador to the Soviet Union, whose name is escaping me at the moment. Uh, but Putin was asking, why are you putting these missiles so close to Russia? Why do you need missile bases in places like Poland and Romania that can that can shoot nuclear missiles uh, and give us seconds to decide on the end of the world? Uh, and he said, no, 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 Vladimir, you don't understand. It has nothing to do with Russia. It's a jobs program for back in the States. <laughs> and of course, you could have any other kind of jobs program. There are millions of kinds of jobs programs you could have, but somebody could have pulled out that study from UMass Amherst and said, no, it isn't. It actually eliminates jobs. Uh, and that would have missed the moral point that you're risking ending all life on earth for no good reason. But it would have been true as far as I know, economically, it, it would have been true that it's not a jobs program. I don't know if that helps at all. Um, I think we're, I, I, we're getting sorry, ahead. go ahead. Uh, okay, we got Steve Walker's next in line. Steve, go ahead and say something. I think Steve Thanks. might be talking. Oh, there you go. Go ahead, Steve. Am I unmuted now? Yes. Yeah, you're good. We hear you. Okay, a couple of points. Uh, first of all, there used to be a woman in East Lansing, and I can't think of her name right now, who did a series of study that showed that investments in, uh, you know, education and things like that produced a lot more jobs than investment in military spending. Uh, and so there, there's all sorts of studies out here that 
show investing in uh, peaceful uh, activities is a lot more productive. Uh, secondly, if you don't realize, the Detroit City Council did pass a resolution in favor of a ceasefire. Originally, there was a lot of static from some of the council members and people all over Detroit rose up in indignation. And so they backed off and the resolution passed eventually overwhelmingly. And again, I think the, the point that Jim was confused about is that the defense industry makes huge profits. It's not that they create jobs, they create money uh, you know, that they can put in their own pockets. And so if, if you're in a public institution that's supposed to maximize, has a pension fund or something or investment fund that's supposed to maximize profits, today investing in the military is a way to maximize your profits. But that, that's totally irrespective of whether they're creating jobs because they're not. Yeah. Very well said. I, I could try to respond very quickly and then maybe go to Sharon, whose hand I think has been up for a long time. Um, if you have any other study other than the ones from UMass Amherst, I would love to see them, uh, whether they agree as it sounds or or disagree. Um, uh, that's terrific that Detroit already passed a ceasefire resolution. Can they pass a resolution uh, for an arms embargo if that was not stated? Can they pass a resolution in support of the bill that Congresswoman Tlaib is introducing next week to say that Congress members cannot own stocks in weapons companies? Um, this is a, this is popular across. I mean, there's like two guys and a dog in the whole country who are against that. It's like so popular. Why should Congress members be owning stocks yeah. in weapons companies and bragging about how they're going to get rich starting new wars, as some of them do? It's disgusting. Uh, the congresswoman uh, from your district is going to introduce a bill on that next week. Um I, I think, you know, we ought to be celebrating and promoting and the local cities ought to be passing resolutions in support. Um, and, and yes, it, it, the stocks are profitable, but the profits are all concentrated military spending. And for God's sake, it is not defense spending. It is not the defense industry The you know, we we ought to be able to bill the weapons companies for payments every time we say that no. propaganda for them. But but we don't. The military spending is a is a major concentrator of wealth. It is not a spreader of wealth. It is not a job creator. It is a concentrator of wealth. Um, uh, the problem we have in Detroit, Dan Gilbert, the billionaire, is very politically influential, and he's a big Zionist. So trying to get more than the ceasefire resolution through the Detroit City Council po poses major problems. And I used to be in Rashida's district. When they reapportioned, I'm now in Chief Anadar's district, and he's been terrible on the uh, Gaza war. Uh, Rashida's wonderful, of course, uh, but her influence over Shri has been very minimal at best. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, Sharon had her hand up, and then you put it down. That's why I didn't call you first. Then you put it back up. So here you go, Sharon. I hope you're, mute you're muted. So, okay. Yeah, there okay. You go. Um, I'm I'm a little confused actually. So would we have no military at all? Or I mean, what ha, what what would it look like if it was if it worked? So the United States spends on its military right now as much, uh, actually more than 227 other countries put together. Every other country on this planet is many times closer to having no military spending at all than they are to the US level of military spending. If the US were to move just a tiny fraction of the way toward the rest of the damn world on military spending, peace would be at hand. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's not necessary to, you know, our choices are not limited to one and a quarter trillion dollars a year or nothing. We could take a step in the direction 
of what military spending was last year or the year before, the year before, the year before, the year before, because it goes up every damn year. Three years ago, the Democratic Party platform of 2020, you can go read it, they haven't hidden it, promises to reduce military spending. And the president proposed to increase it each of the past three years. And the Congress said, we're going to increase it even more than you asked, sir. Uh, and, and so it, the, it's been shooting upward at you know a steep angle. Uh, the, 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 the options available are not limited to immediately eliminating it all, which seems rather unlikely. Um, but if you want my personal opinion, we should, yes. We should eliminate it all immediately. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I would assume that's where uh, the right wingers are standing in the sense that they want to save, you know, protect our country. And the more money we spend on military, the more protected we are. It's, it's, yeah, it is demonstrably false. Yeah. During the war on terror in, in Africa, for example, Nick Terse reported recently terrorism has gone up 75,000%. This is counterproductive stuff. The, what, what other country is, is generating enemies at the pace of the United States? Could South Africa, could a military in South Africa have done anything to make South Africa remotely as safe as it made itself by holding up the rule of law at the International Court of Justice? The world loves South Africa. Uh, you know, there, there, there are no terrorism groups enraged by provision of food and medicine. It doesn't exist. This is counterproductive, enemy generating stuff. Uh, and it's not making anyone safer. And global polling backs that up. It's not appreciated. You know, you're making the world safe uh, despite its wishes, against its will. You know, so we shouldn't, we shouldn't give that sort of align much respect, although we have to counter it because it's in the newspaper every day. Okay, well, so uh, the reason we have you with us here today, David, is because one of our members uh, suggested to me that we should try to reach you, and I said, this sounds like an impossible task, but uh, it so happens I'm on the board of the U.S. Peace Council, and um, Margaret Flowers uh, responded to my request and she says hey he's a good friend of mine so uh, i'll give him a call and david contact me right away and that's how we got you so this is the guy who wanted you to be here this is chuck kester so go ahead chuck hi chuck you're muted okay oh, i am muted now okay no, yeah. I'm okay now yeah yep. all right okay uh we've been talking about and i like your comment about contacting congress it's like going to a black hole i can personally relate to that one appreciate your efforts and read your books anyway uh what we're talking about i was wondering about uh with all this stuff going on in the middle east right now i get rather perturbed by the uh media mainstream media both in print and uh on on radio and tv uh how they seem to be pushing this stuff, the, the escalation into, uh, you know, Nora O'Donnell, you know, being on, flying over to the Middle East, you know, being on the uh, uh, ships and the planes, you know, and just giving a, a, a minute by minute description of what we're going to do next and the next Tomahawk missile we're going to send into Yemen, you know, at, at what, 2.8 or $3 million a, a pop. <laughs> anyway, the media seems to be really a, a spokesman for for this militarism also. And my point is, is there any effective way? I know I've written, you know, uh, some of the media companies. Uh, I've heard they're, you know, they can be uh, sensitive to stuff. Or is there any efforts in that in educating them or calling them out? Or are they just stenographers for the 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 government and we're wasting our our time on that but i i think they play an important role in our culture uh in in uh, pushing this militarism that's my question is that clear enough uh crystal clear and i don't think there's any question about it uh we couldn't have these wars without the corporate media and were the corporate media to show the damage and the victims of every side of every war, the way they have shown some Ukrainians and some Israelis, war would be abolished. It just wouldn't outlive that. Uh, and it only continues because people are erased. 
the people of Gaza are largely erased. The you know most uh, of most wars, at least one side, is completely eliminated as far as the suffering. Uh, you know, people are outraged by the war on Gaza as they damn well should be, and throw around words like genocide as they damn well should. Uh, but only because of the speed of it and only because of the open profession of genocidal uh, intentions by the Israeli government, this, this war is less one-sided in terms of the dying and injury than, for example, the U.S. war in Iraq or the U.S. war in Afghanistan. These were one-sided slaughters, even more so than the one in Gaza. And the media didn't tell anyone that. You can ask people in the United States what percentage of troops who died in, in Iraq or people who died in Iraq were U.S. troops. And they'll say 50% or 20% or 80%, you know, not 3% as they should, you know. And you look at the coverage of, uh, you know, Michigan population and Joe Biden and the whole story, even on things like Democracy Now! is Biden may be losing the Arab American vote because of genocide in Gaza. Well, wh why wouldn't he be losing the human vote? Why wouldn't he be losing the vote of anyone who cares about mass murder of human beings? And who the hell cares about votes many months from now? Well, you know, this is what the media does. It, it tells you all you can do is, is wait for four years and then vote and then shut up for four years and, and sit on your hands and then vote, uh, which is you know absolutely absurd. People are having a huge impact. Uh, people are changing the media as well as passing resolutions, as well as moving uh, international courts and governments around the world. Uh, and to some limited extent, the US government uh, and we have to keep it up and we have to stop telling ourselves it's it's pointless. There are people doing protests at media outlets, doing letter to the editor campaigns, call in campaigns, op ed campaigns. Uh, the media is absolutely disgraceful. Fairness and accuracy in reporting did a study in the build up to the war in Iraq uh, and found that three percent of the guests on the big talk shows on the corporate media and PBS, the Pentagon Broadcasting Service, were <laughs> anti-war in any way. Now it's zero. Now it's zero. It's not 3%. They don't have anti-war guests on. Uh, and, you know, they're, they're doing this in the name of democracy, when despite the media, the majority of people in the media's own polls say, no, we're against this. Uh, and, and so we, we have to make our own media. We have to record things like this and share it with each other and, and things better than this. But, but we also have to have to continue teaching people how to understand the media uh, and how to, to push it uh, and, and how to compel it to cover things you want. Uh, and Sometimes nonviolent protests do that. Sometimes billboards do that. Sometimes countless letters to the editor do that. Um, we have to keep trying. A lot of people talk about Western mainstream media, and yet uh, they're not all the same, of course. There's very uh, progressive outlets in the West. Uh, would you consider uh, shows like Democracy Now! as part of the mainstream news? I would consider it uh, far from perfect, far from agreeing with me on every point every day, although maybe that's not actually a desirable uh, model of perfection. Uh, but in other words, I have lots of serious complaints now and then with democracy now, but I consider it thousands of times better uh, than anything anyone has told me exists on cable news networks or uh, traditional broadcast news networks or so-called public television. Uh, I'm not aware of anything close. Uh, I'm aware of lots of other sources uh, that are as good or better. Um, lots of websites and podcasts and newspapers and newspapers outside the United States. Um, but uh, I, I 
I find a lot of great stuff coming from democracy now, but I find great stuff coming from the New York Times, which I, you know, I think we would all be dramatically better off if the New York Times were abolished tomorrow. But there's good reporting in it if you know how to look for it. Uh, and sometimes it's buried in horrible articles. <laughs> I'd like to, I'd like to white out 80% of the thing. But you know, I, I think this is what people have to understand is that they they have to stop asking at the end of every event, what is the true biblical media source that I can trust with my whole heart and soul? No, there isn't one. You have to learn how to read and how to listen and how to watch uh, the media and separate the verifiable reporting that has sources and is asserting facts from all the slant uh, and spin and fluff and and angling of of those facts and uh, and and find the things that are being omitted. Um, but if you go to if you go to find anti-war news at anti-war websites like antiwar.com or worldbeyondwar.org or progressivehub.org and you go to common dreams and truth out and uh, and and you go to all the the sources well and people email you all the good stuff cuz they think you need to see it you know there's there's a lot of good reporting going on out there um and sometimes it's in the very worst, you know, sometimes it's in the New York Post or Fox News or the New York Times or wherever. Um, but we have to we have to be able to 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 spot it um, and not just, you know, make a list of the bad media outlets and the good media outlets because it won't you know, it'll let us down if we try that. I remember a rally I went to once uh that uh, it was a big, important rally at the time. I can't remember the specific subject, but there was no media there at all. And we always are upset because media doesn't show up to anything. And I thought, wow, this whole big rally is totally wasted. Nobody's going to see what the point they were making. And that night I uh, got on press TV from Iran, and there was the report from the rally in the U.S. with everybody being interviewed. And I learned all about the rally, that like nobody in the West covered it all. And then, of course, uh, you know that press TV was banned in the United States. So I'm starting to learn that any network that's banned in the U.S. is probably one that we should try to watch. <laughs> the, uh, the, the trouble is that nobody in Iran trusts press TV because it's from the Iranian government. And nobody in the U.S., except for a few of you, trusts press TV because it's demonized by the U.S. government. Um, it, it, the problem with press TV itself is that it's very good on horrible things the U.S. government has done. But it's not very good on horrible things the Iranian government or certain other governments have done. And it's, you know, it's not it's not as concerned with accuracy as it ought to be. Um, but that doesn't mean you won't find hugely important stories on press TV that you don't find anywhere else. Um, and then you look into them further. Um, you know, this is... This is what we have to have to be able to do. But if there's if somebody goes to the trouble of holding a, a panel event or a rally and doesn't make their own good video at this point, I mean, that that it should be a crime. I, I mean, it, it's just the biggest waste because we're now able to rival these media outlets with our own media productions. Um, they, they have to be good and we have to get lucky and they have to be hot and timely, but uh, you know, even the, even the most amateur unedited video of the most boring event ever gets at least 10 times, maybe a hundred, the views of the people who actually showed up at the event. And so not to do it, uh, it, 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 you know, I mean, I've been saying this for decades. I will, I will go on not understanding for decades why anybody would go to all the trouble to organize an event and recruit speakers and and promote it and have and, and then not put out a video within an hour showing what happened. It, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, thank you. So uh, uh, we got Chuck and Tom Tobin on. Uh, Chuck, do you have something to follow up on this subject? Are you are sure we take, take uh, I'll I'll do why don't we take Tobin first because he hasn't oh. spoken yet and then I'll yeah. I just have something basically to say, but take Tobin first. Okay, Tobin and then Chuck. 
Hi, Tobin. Hi. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, David, for, uh, for being here. And I appreciate uh, uh, what you said about uh, the complexity as far as finding uh, good material within the band. And what Tobin, I tried Stop for a second. It's hard to hear what you're saying. I'll uh, cut out my video. Hopefully, this helps. Much better. Go ahead. Okay. Um, part of, when I uh, talk to people about these things, those rare instances I get, uh, the challenge is to try to direct them to resources um, before we can uh, come back to it. And one of the challenges is knowing what you're looking for and, and being able to sort out the good from the bad. And I, that's always a challenge to me. I think do you start that conversation with uh, fundamental things. I'll take Gaza as an example. Uh, you start with uh, uh, stopping the stopping the killing. You start with the demand for ceasefire. That's the very very bare minimum threshold you can ask. In in before you even get into the uh, complexities of that, um, is. <sighs> Is that a good? Is is there a uh, really good way to start that conversation with somebody, your fr uh, a friend who is not really politically engaged, or follows uh, the same news that most everybody else does and gets their uh, their news sourced? I mean, people who people who don't watch or read or listen to the news and don't have much of a clue what's going on at all are, are very easy to persuade of anything because you can just tell them what the important facts are and what to think about them. Um, but, uh, but does it last very long? I don't know. Um, I think you need a, 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 a richer education and understanding than just that uh, to have it last. Um, people who think that uh, Congress needs to send billions of dollars more of weaponry to Israel to protect Israel's right to defend itself against the evildoers. Uh, they do read or listen to uh, some kind of media. Uh, it just isn't very good. Uh, and I think, you know, the worst way to talk to them uh, is to be one of these so-called peace activists who cheers for the violence against Israel by Hamas or justifies it because it's smaller or it's anti-imperial or it's anti-colonial or Israel exaggerated it or Israel lied about it or not as many women got raped as they said. And so, it, you know, I mean, this is not just disgusting and immoral, but you, you, you're not, you're not going to you know, you go carrying pictures of Chairman Mao, you ain't going to make it with anyone anyhow. And the way to start is, is to understand the thing that they've been told about forever and ever. Like, yes, I agree with you. It's horrible to murder people on October the 7th. Is it also horrible to murder hundreds of times that many people ever since October the 7th? children having their legs cut off tonight on kitchen tables without anesthesia with no food or water in sight is that good because of something that happened on october 7th how what's the what's the calculation have them think about the suffering of you they aren't shown palestinians with names and pets and aspirations and favorite songs the way they are israelis and ukrainians uh, I don't know what it is people think humans are until the humans are so-called humanized, but apparently you have to humanize every damn human on the planet before people will care about that human. And so, you know, we have to humanize them. So we have to, first of all, humanize ourselves. No, I don't work for Hamas. No, Putin has not paid me to kill Israelis. I, I'm with you on the evil of killing Israelis. I'm, I couldn't be more against it. I'm also against crimes a thousandfold bigger. Uh, and this model of it's our 9-11, therefore we have a license to not treat a crime as a crime, but to treat a crime as an excuse for much larger crimes 
isn't working. And it didn't work for the United States. It's been a disaster for 20 years. And the fact that George W. Bush is not behind bars, that he's a celebrated artist instead, is not is not a moral justification for letting countries like Israel go around claiming their own 9-11s. It's, you know, it's a modeling a catastrophe on a disaster. Um, and I, I don't know. I think every single person is different. There's every possible variety of response you're going to get to every sentence you say. So it depends on the individual. The important thing is to sit down with them, listen to them, take infinite time to make sure they understand that you're with them on the things they care about, and then try to explain the things they ought to care about. Like, you know, I mean, people have been saying this since October 8th, right? Biden was right to care about Israelis. Can he care about non-Israelis? Like, this is, I think we have, what we have to try. Beautifully said. Chuck, uh, I think this will be the last comment or question, unless we have somebody else. Okay, Maris will be, uh, Maris, do you want to go? Maris and then Chuck, go ahead. Maris, um, I guess um, Chuck really said, yeah. when I was thinking, when you talked first, which was, I'm watching PBS, and they're sitting around a table, and they're discussing that there's 85 targets against Yemen, there's 26 targets in Syria, 20, and nobody is asking the question, who gave the United States the right to go bomb in Yemen? And they're not telling you that there are human beings that were killed in Yemen, and there are human beings getting killed in Iraq and Syria, but they leave that out. Where are the 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 questioners or the people that talk to um, the, the people that they come out with. Why, why aren't they giving the, the actual facts? And who, who gives Israel the right to assassinate somebody in Lebanon? I mean, since when? I mean, isn't there some law against this? Didn't we pass some law that you can't extrajudicial kill people in another country and then we took b bombers <laughs> all the way from the u.s to do i don't know how many pounds so pound bombers that we're using to get the underground um munitions mm -hmm. that are given to iraq and to syria by iran or whatever and how many are getting killed there? I mean, 200 pound bombs and or 2000 pound bombs have been used in Gaza that we've given them. You know, I mean, how come there isn't any more outrage about this war? They could stop the Houthis from doing the shipping if they would just say no to Israel and vote yes on a ceasefire in the Security Council. How come, where are our um, policymakers or leaders or government? You know, I, I, yeah. I don't get it. I don't get the media listening and not saying, well, how come you're doing that? You know, is, isn't there something wrong with that isn't there a law somewhere <laughs> i don't know you can tell me but it just doesn't seem right that we should be we are now involved two two navy seals died because they were trying to intercept some um stuff from iran that was going to the houthis or something and and they died but nobody's talking about those navy seals but we have three three people that got killed in Jordan in a base of ours that we've been there for I don't know how long. We, we've got to do something about getting rid of Biden. Let's talk about that, too. <laughs> I, I mean, let's really talk about that. We, we've got Jill Stein, who's a peace person. She's she's already um, been on the ballot. She'll be getting up on all the ballots. And I think we should just start 
changing the players because we're not going to change Joe Biden. <laughs> well, Maris, thank you for your righteous indignation. You are, you're correct <laughs> in that. And, you know, we're running out of time. And I'm sorry, Chuck, unless you got something real short for yeah. David. Go All ahead. Right, I'm going to say uh, we're going to close this up here. And I think uh, I'm going to say what I think the problem is, is that uh, somehow the U.S. American oil got underneath those countries in the Middle East. I don't know how it got there, but we got to get it back. And that's why I think we're over there. That's one of the main reasons. Money, power. And I think that's what David said originally. That's why we spend money for profit on weaponry. That's the main cause. So, David, I'm going to let you say the last few words and we'll close out here. Well, I love that Maris said who gave the United States the right as opposed to who gave the president the right. Only Congress has the right to commit the worst crimes in the world and mass murder men, women and children across the globe, which is the extreme left wing progressive position of your very best Congress members. Uh, I I assume Rashida Tlaib, I know for certain Ro Khanna, this is his position. Uh, the president is violating the Constitution. It's Congress that has the right to murder anybody it wants. But the important thing is to reelect that president, uh, not impeach him, not hold him accountable. Just use rhetoric against him and tell everyone to vote for Genocide Joe, which is, you know, is not a consistent position. And why does the media not care? Because the U.S. media doesn't care if the entire rest of the world, 96% of humanity is against something, if neither the Republican nor the Democratic Party is against it. Doesn't care if 80% of the U.S. public is against it, if neither the Republican nor the Democratic Party is against it. Uh, and, you know, this is, this is what we're up against. So we have to make our own media. We have to push the media. Uh, and, and we have to recognize that neither of these parties is against it uh, and that elections are a major waste of our time and money and energy. Yeah, of course, vote for the good people, but don't put any energy into that. Uh, and yes, of course, wars are illegal and murder is illegal. And there's, you know, millions of laws being violated here. And who gave Israel the right? The U.S. government gives Israel the right. That's that's an easy one. The U.S. government gives them the weapons, gives them the vetoes, 44 vetoes against Palestinian rights at the U.N. Security Council in recent years. The, the U.S. government, Genocide Joe, gives Israel the right uh, and could take it away, but won't. I want to mention that uh, in Michigan, which is a swing state, for the Democrats here, the, that the Muslim American community has uh, started a campaign against Biden, a very strong campaign. And uh, Biden, Biden people know this, and um, especially here in Hamtramck, which is the only Muslim majority city in America. Uh, they have many uh, campaigns going on now to uh, put in instead for their candidate, uh, free Palestine instead of Joe Biden. Uh, so you'll hear this in the news on election day that the, he's probably going to lose Michigan because of it. But David, I just want to thank you so much for giving your time to our, our small little peace, Michigan Peace Council group that ho hopefully will be growing. And I want to thank Margaret Flowers for contacting us with you and, and all the stuff that you do is so well appreciated. David, thank you for being here. Thank you. Okay. Adios. We'll thank keep you, the David. Uh, membership, but we'll uh, video. Oops, I'm not ending the meeting. Ending the meeting. Okay, so I'm going to stop the video.